Hello, Shadily Push. Welcome to another episode of United States History. Today we are looking at period four of the uh, the College Board. Out of their nine periods, period four is a very important one. It covers 1800 to 1848, and really this is the the young nation. Um, you know, we got our new fancy constitution in 1789, we had our first president, and now we're kind of off and running, so we're trying to figure out what this country, uh, is looking like. So if we look at the, the key concepts, the three key concepts for this, um, period, uh, 4.1, we are developing, uh, this modern democracy and, and trying to define what our ideals will be. Um, and those will will change over the course of this period. We also see 4.2 with various innovations in technology, um, which we looked at a lot of these new uh, inventions, and uh, really the growth of the economy and how uh, there's going to be different regional identities, meaning the north, the south, the west, and uh, with very different economies and very different goals and that will maybe lead to some conflict later on and then 4.3 um increasing our our borders our boundaries uh things like the louisiana purchase so um we are going to look in this lecture really at the first seven president or the sorry presidents two through seven we already covered uh, George Washington. So we will look at the second president, John Adams, all the way to the seventh president, uh, which is Andrew Jackson. So let's start with uh, John Adams. So we left off uh, with George Washington, who really set various precedents, things that other presidents would follow. Um, and so uh, George Washington's vice president, uh, John Adams, is uh, elected. Uh, as president in 1796. He's sworn in in 1797. Now he runs uh, against uh, Thomas Jefferson for the presidency. Adams is a Federalist. Uh, Jefferson is a Democratic Republican. And although George Washington was not a member of a political party, he was basically a Federalist for the most part. Um, so we're really staying with uh, that, that kind of... Uh, political philosophy. Um, now, campaigns in this early American history were very different than uh, campaigns today. First off, presidents really didn't campaign. They didn't go out and give speeches. They thought that was beneath them. So you wouldn't see Adams or Jefferson uh, traveling around giving speeches. They stayed at home. Other people gave speeches on their behalf. Uh, we really don't see president's campaigning until Andrew Jackson uh, in the 1820s. So um, Adams wins, uh, but because of the weird uh, nature of the, uh, the electoral system in this era, um, the person that got second place would be vice president. You know, they didn't run as a pair yet. That will come uh, later after we amend the Constitution. Um, and so Thomas Jefferson gets second place, and uh, therefore he is the uh, vice president. And Adams and Jefferson in this time period really didn't get along very well at all. Later on, they will make up uh, in the 1820s, uh, just prior to both of them dying. And they actually both died on the same day. They died on the 4th of July. Um, anyway, so Adam, he, he only serves uh, um, four years. He's not re-elected to a second term um, and really not remembered as a great president. Um, but he did a lot of stuff, you know, beyond being the president for the country. Um, so some of the things that you need to know about John Adams quickly going through is uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, he wants to really silence uh, people that are opposed to him, really the Democratic Republicans and uh, really the French influence. Now, the Federalists, which Adams was, uh, are more closely aligned with the British, whereas the Democratic Republicans are more closely aligned with the French. So 
Uh, the alien part of it is going to restrict immigration to America. Um, and the sedition part is speech. He's going to restrict uh, freedom of speech. Uh, you could not you know, say anything bad about the president or anything uh, um, uh, bad about the government. Uh, you could be arrested for it. And journalists were. People, Democratic, Republican journalists, people that sided with Jefferson, they were arrested. Now, the question back then in American history is when something is unconstitutional, which the Alien and Sedition Acts were easily unconstitutional, the question is who gets to decide what's unconstitutional? Um, is it the Supreme Court? Is it Congress? Um, or is it the states? Uh, who gets to decide? And really, that, that wasn't very clear. It's kind of interesting that that wasn't very clear. Why, why they didn't put that in the Constitution, I don't know. Um, but it wasn't very clear who gets to decide if something is unconstitutional. Now, Madison and Jefferson think that states uh, should be able to decide if something is unconstitutional. And so they draft the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Uh, the Virginia one is drafted by Madison and the uh, Kentucky one is drafted by Jefferson, even though he didn't live in Kentucky. Uh, but basically saying that states have a right to nullify or not obey um, something that Congress passes if they think that it is unconstitutional. Um, this will eventually be figured out in 1803 with a court case called Marbury versus Madison, uh, where now the Supreme Court has the power to uh, essentially rule or you know define what is constitutional or unconstitutional, which is the power that they still have today. All right, so John Adams, the election of 1800, this is going to be... Um, uh, basically the same, the, uh, the, a rematch. Um, and this time Thomas Jefferson will win. And this was a dirty campaign. Um, they were both saying lies about each other. Again, they were not campaigning. There were other people that were doing this on their behalf. Um, but Jefferson wins, uh, this election and it's known as the revolution of 1800. So the election was in 1800. He's not sworn in until the, the March of 1801. So the elections are always the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, but he's not sworn in until March. Now it's January 20th. They moved it, um, but that comes later. So it was known as the Revolution of 1800. A big question is, should it be considered a revolution? Um, and that's kind of a common uh, long essay question that I've seen on the AP exam. Um, it could be a DBQ, something, you know, comparing Jefferson and Jackson, maybe that's a possible DBQ, but here are the, uh, the main events of Jefferson's presidency quickly. I will go through them. Uh, he serves two terms. Um, what's interesting is he continues Hamilton's national bank, something that he was opposed to. Um, he continues it. So actually Jefferson as president is, is very different than, uh, um, the man before, uh, being president as far as his political philosophy. Uh, he was very opposed to, uh, he said, you know, you can only do what the Constitution says. He was a strict constructionist. Uh, but as president, uh, he was doing a lot of, a lot of uh, Hamiltonian type things, like continuing the National Bank. Um, he, he purchases Louisiana. Now, he was unsure of whether or not he had the constitutional ability to do this. Now, he, he actually uh, was talking to his uh, advisors, and he wanted to uh, amend the Constitution to allow him to buy Louisiana. His, advisor says, as vi his advisors said, no, I don't think we need to do that. Um, it's under your treaty-making abilities. Maybe we can kind of you know, interpret the Constitution broadly to allow you to do this. Um, and so that's what he did. And he was really he was criticized by the Federalists for doing this, again because as the country grows and as people are moving west, we are taking power away from Federalist strongholds, which is generally in the north, places like New England. Those that's where the Federalists uh, had power. So as the country grows, uh, the Federalists will lose power, um, and so the Federalists were were generally opposed to this. But it ended up being a a, a good deal. Uh, and this was James Monroe that actually was the one that, that uh, uh, did this deal, bought Louisiana from Napoleon because he needed some money. Um, uh, other things that you can look at, but uh, there's this there's this fight 
between, you know, in France and Great Britain, they're fighting again, which is not surprising. And, um, you know, they are harassing, both sides are really harassing uh, American ships as we are trading. Um, and the British are impressing, um, they, meaning what they would do is they would they would stop our ships on on the seas and they would take uh, the, the members of the ship and put them into the British Navy known as impressment. And, um, you know, this is really could could be considered an act of war. Jefferson, Jefferson thought about going to war. Instead, what he does is uh, he wants to avoid war. So he passes the Embargo Act, which basically he says we're going to cut off all trade. So no ships can leave the port. We're not going to trade with any foreign nations, France, Great Britain, whatever. We're not going to trade with any of them. And this was very unpopular. Um, but the question is, does he have the power to do that? And, well, if you in interpret the Constitution broadly, if you do a Hamiltonian, maybe. Um, so that's something that he does as well. This will later on lead, essentially the same issue will lead to war, the War of 1812, uh, which will be the next president, which is Madison. Um, the slave trade is abolished in 1808. That was the earliest it could be done. Um, there was a 20-year limit where this could not be abolished. That was in the Constitution. You can't abolish the slave trade for 20 years. That expired in 1808, and they um, abolished the slave trade. Um, and so Jefferson kind of gets credit for that, even though, you know, which I guess is okay, even though Jefferson was a, uh, a slave owner and really... Um, you know, partially elected because of slavery, because of the three-fifths compromise, which gave the southern states more electoral power. Um, and so they said that he kind of uh, entered the presidency on the, on, the, on the shoulders of these slaves or the slave owners, that if it wasn't for them, he wouldn't have been elected. Um, but in 1808, he abolishes the slave trade. Um, and it's important to note that, that most the early presidents, all of them were slave owners besides John Adams, which is interesting. Um, so let's move on. I showed you that map of the, the Louisiana Purchase, um, which, you know, more than doubles the size of the nation. And that will cause some conflict as we are growing. Obviously, more land equals more problems. So let's talk about James Madison who was uh, um, a, Jeffers a Jeffersonian. He was a Democratic Republican, basically the same as Thomas Jefferson, um, and the father of the Constitution. Uh, and uh, he was uh, Jefferson's Secretary of State. That's going to be the theme here, is that the Secretaries of State will then become president. Uh, Jefferson was Secretary of State, Madison Secretary of State, Monroe Secretary of State, and John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State. And they all became uh, president. So James Madison, really, we don't see a lot of, of information usually on tests about James Madison. But if you do, um, usually it's something like the War of 1812, which was fought over shipping, the same thing that Jefferson was, was dealing with. Uh, Madison declares war. Um, the war lasts until 1815. The name is kind of misleading. Um, and this war with Great Britain, sometimes known as the Second War for Independence, um, was very unpopular amongst the Federalists. Again, the Federalists are more likely to to um, to like the British, whereas the Democratic Republicans were more with the French. And so uh, New England, in general, opposed this war. Um, the war was, was more popular in the South and the West. And uh, the Federalists even talked about, during, during the war, about possibly seceding from the Union because of uh, this war. Um, which essentially, the, obviously, the South will make that same argument uh, in the 1860s, and the South will actually secede. But uh, New England talked about it. Um, and Madison, again, doing a, 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 a Hamiltonian thing, uh, reauthorizing the National Bank, uh, which is Hamilton's bank, uh, a protective tariff, basically um, Henry Clay's American system, which I have a separate slide for that. I will we'll talk about Henry Clay separately. separately. So hold off on that. But uh, um, you see this uh, War of 1812 slide here, which really made Andrew Jackson a war hero. Um, and Andrew Jackson is always fair game for uh, DBQs, definitely. But let's talk about the next president after Madison, which is James Monroe. He's going to be the last of the founding father, 
presidents. Um, he was Secretary of State, very good Secretary of State. Um, and um, it's known as the era of good feelings because the Federalists are pretty much done after the Hartford Convention. The Federalists go away. And so um, politics, uh, it's shifting now. We're going to be entering the second party system soon, which would be the Democrats and the Whigs. So the first party system is the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. So this is kind of a shifting period now. The important thing for James Monroe that you need to know, the Monroe Doctrine, which was actually written by his Secretary of State, which was John Quincy Adams, says Europe is no longer welcome in America, in the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. They cannot colonize. If they try to come in and colonize, take colonies, we will fight you. Although we really didn't have the ability to fight them. We were just talking and uh, no one called us on our bluff, so that was nice. And then the Missouri Compromise, that's going to be the big thing that'll kind of begin our trek, if you will, towards uh, Civil War. And I have a separate slide for the Missouri Compromise that I'll put up. But you can see now the, the progression of uh, slave states and free states. By the 1770s, we see um, states getting rid of slavery. And these are states in uh, the north, generally in New England, which makes sense. They didn't have as much slaves there. Um, you're not going to see huge plantations. So really uh, the need for them, uh, you don't see the need for them as much. Um, whereas in the South, you're going to see a huge growth of slavery. Um, and they were, the South is going to make lots of money off of slaves, um, growing tobacco, sugar, cotton, which will, uh, start, uh, especially after Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin. Um, in the late 1700s and in the early 1800s, really, uh, a lot of people thought slavery would die out, yet it was reinvigorated, really, with the invent invention of the cotton gin and uh, that cotton-growing region in the South. Um, and they were, you know, something like they produced two-thirds of the world's cotton, something like that. They were making lots of money. And obviously the North was complicit in this. The North was, you know, insuring the slaves, and they were the bankers. So they were definitely in inv involved in slavery. Uh, but you can see this this divide that is taking place um, by 1800. Um, and uh, now by 1820, as as we are growing, so we have more land thanks to the to the uh, Louisiana Purchase, um, and uh, we are adding states. Uh, the question is, should the states be free states or slave states, and who should get to decide? Should Congress decide? Should that individual state get to decide? Um, but partially by design, partially by chance, as they were adding new states, Alabama, etc., cetera, um, it seemed there was always the balance in the Senate. There was a, an equal amount of free states and slave states. So each state gets two senators. And so if you keep that balance in the Senate, that means one side can't outvote the other. So the free uh, state can't outvote the slave states and vice versa. And they kind of liked that. Um, yet now Missouri actually wants to become a state and they want to become a slave state that would have given the slave states more power in the Senate. And, uh, and because of the three fifths, um, clause in the uh, constitution, also, um, quite a bit of power in the house of representatives. Um, so the free staters don't like that Missouri wants to become a slave state. There's some tension here. In comes our friend. You guessed it. Henry Clay. Henry Clay uh, comes in known as a great compromiser. We'll have a separate slide just for Henry Clay. Um, so hold off. Um, ran for president like 30 times and lost every time. Um, so he comes in and he, and he has a compromise. The Missouri Compromise. Um, and this is definitely fair game for a DBQ. I could see a DBQ on something dealing with slavery before you know um, the civil war um uh, anyways missouri compromise uh missouri enters as a slave state maine would enter as a free state uh, maine was actually part of massachusetts so maine would be carved out of massachusetts and they would enter as a free state thereby keeping the balance in the senate and they would also draw draw a line at 36 degrees 30 minutes where no slavery would be allowed north of that line in the Louisiana Purchase. Okay. Besides Missouri. Missouri is north of that line, but it was okay, but nothing else. 
We'll see if that will cause issues later. All right, so take a break from the presidents. We're at Monroe. Um, now we're going to talk about some economics. We're going to talk about the market revolution, which, you know, usually I refer to this time period before the Civil War as the market revolution, and then after the Civil War as the industrial revolution, uh, which is like the robber baron stuff. We'll talk about that later. Um, but the market revolution, um, really, we see this shift, and this is 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. We see the shift of America from uh, largely agrarian, meaning agriculture, farming, to more of a capitalist society. What we're going to see is people actually like going to work, like they're going to go to a factory and work. And obviously, these factories are going to mainly be in the north and the west, and the south is really all in on uh, you know agriculture mainly because they're making crazy amounts of money on it. Um, so they don't really see a need for this. And, and the South is really going to criticize uh, this factory system, the idea that someone would go to work and work for a wage. You would work for an hourly wage. I mean, in the South, um, they thought that was worse than slavery, that people would actually do that. And even, you know, people like Thomas Jefferson criticize that. People that go to a job and work for a wage, they are not the boss um, uh, and they are, um, you know, according to Jefferson and many others, they are, they are basically slaves, wage slaves. Um, but that's what we see is, is a growth of factories, uh, people going to a job, generally male, but there's going to be, uh, women that did this like in Massachusetts at the Lowell, uh, mills. So women, mainly young unmarried women, uh, that will do this as well. But again, it's known as the market revolution because people are now, you know, selling things at market. And, and even farmers are obviously part of this because they could grow their goods and they can now ship them to a, to a distant market instead of just growing it for your local market. And uh, really things like uh, the building of canals will allow the goods to be shipped. And I'll show you a map of canals. Most canals will be in the north. Uh, again, canals, uh, railroads will replace canals in the 1850s, 1860s. Uh, you can see the population growth. You're going to see huge population growth, huge immigration to America. Most immigrants are going to live in the north because that's where the jobs are. And because of the increased immigration, they're also going to get increased representation in government, increased uh, political power, which means that now you get to essentially, you know, uh, or eventually um, uh, choose the president. Um, so the power is, is going to start to shift, not quite yet, but it's gonna, it's starting to shift uh, to the north, uh, whereas uh, a lot of the power was in the south in early American history. So huge population growth, huge immigration. Uh, immigration is a whole separate thing that we'll talk about, um, but a lot of immigrants from Ireland and uh, Germany, but you can see the population density here in red, where more people are living, obviously that's that's in the north and the west, place, places like Ohio, um, you know, Pennsylvania that are growing fast in Chicago. Um, and the map of the canals, most of the canal, a canal is essentially a man-made river, if you will. It joins bodies of water. It can join, like if you see the Hudson River there in New York, the, the Erie Canal would join the Hudson River to the Great Lakes. And so now you could ship, you could uh, ship goods, you know, from from Cincinnati, which was a big uh, meat processing area. You could ship goods from Cincinnati all the way to uh, to New York City, and uh, it was way faster than before. So um, a response to this second to this market revolution. So the market revolution, people going to a job, going to a factory, working, um, kind of unsurprisingly led to. Uh, increasing uh, depression, alcoholism, um, an incre you know, regimented life. And so partially in response to them, the market revolution is the Second Great Awakening. And um, there's going to be effects of the Second Great Awakening as well. So the Second Great Awakening is bigger than the first one, and they're about 100 years apart. So the first one was like 1730s, this one's like 1830s, 1840s, and it's re religious revivalism. And so you see the growth there of the various... Uh, Protestant denominations, mainly Protestant denominations. Um, and whereas before this revival, one in 10 people were church members, actually went to church. Um, 
That doesn't mean that, that the other nine didn't believe in God. It's just one in 10 actively went to church. And whereas after this revival, eight in 10 went to church. And a lot of these new church members are going to be women. And we're going to, one of the effects of the second great awakening is increased protests against slavery. So the abolitionist movement is going to pick up uh, about the inequality, uh, the inequalities that women are facing in this time period. Um, and so the second great awakening leads to these reform movements. And now this is definitely fair game for the DBQ. I could see a DBQ about this and I've seen it before. Um, so the reform movements and, and, the, and the way I remember it is the acronym taped worm. Yes, I know worm is spelled incorrectly, but it works. So, uh, taped worm. Uh, these are all the various, uh, reform movements in the 1830s, 1840s, uh, most of them connected to kind of this religious revivalism uh, in some way, I would say. So temperance, which is uh, getting rid of alcohol. Again, this is a reaction against the, uh, the market revolution. And with the Second Great Awakening, you know, a lot of people's lives were individually changed, especially women, you know, black people, uh, Native Americans were accepted into these denominations. Um, it was more democratic. Um, and so their lives were changed. They want to go out and change society. They want to create this heaven on earth. That's what they want to do. So we see temperance. We see the abolitionist movement pick up. We see prison reform uh, with people like Dorothea Dix. We see education reform with people like Horace Mann and, and the idea of public edu education really in, in places like Massachusetts. Uh, public education is not going to pick up in the South um, as quick, uh, although I would argue that the South had the most educated people, although they were few, um, because these, these rich plantation owners would send their kids to, uh, boarding schools and the best colleges. Um, and so they were generally opposed to public schools, debtors, prisons, the side, people would go to prison for debt, very common. Uh, if you had debt, you'd go to prison, uh, which is technically illegal today, although there are some instances where people still go to jail for debt. Women's rights movement's going to pick up. We really see that with the Seneca Falls Declaration in 1848, which is why I think the years for this period ends in 1848 is, is that's really kind of the, the beginning of this, of this movement. And again, they don't get the right to vote till 1920, so, uh, which is crazy. Um, we see the utopias. They want to create these perfect societies, the Shakers, Oneida, you know, um, and, and those places that we looked at uh, with their kind of free love. Um, yeah. Uh, religious revivalism, which is essentially the Second Great Awakening. So that's sometimes, that's, you know, sometimes part of the reform movements, which I always think of it as the reform movements are a response or are an effect of the uh, Second Great Awakening. And then uh, mental institutions, which is kind of connected to prison reform. So taped worm is an easy way to remember this. Uh, definitely fair game. So, And there is an assignment that you're going to be looking at with this to dive in deeper to the reform mov movements. Now, let's jump back to Henry Clay. Um, important uh, person in the United States hit history. Never was president, but was known as a great compromiser. And really more of a... Uh, kind of a Hamiltonian, I would say, a, a federalist, uh, strong federal government um, versus like states' rights, which is going to be more of a Jeffersonian type of belief. Um, ran for president a lot, uh, is a founder uh, or kind of one of the main people of the Whig Party, uh, which is essentially the anti-Jackson party. So when we get Andrew Jackson, uh, we'll have the Whigs and the Democrats. That's the second party system. He's a Whig. Um, and he's known for something called the American system, which is a little in, influenced a lot by Alexander Hamilton. We'll have tariffs to protect American industry. A tariff is a tax on stuff coming into the, into the country. So if we tax foreign goods, those goods become more expensive. That encourages us to make our own goods. That encourages American factories. Now, the North and the West like the tariff because that's where the factories are. The South doesn't like the tariff because the goods are more expensive now. The South would buy their goods from England because they were cheaper and they were better. Now with the tariff, now they got to buy more expensive American goods and they're not as good. Uh, 
Henry Clay also supports a national bank, um, which Andrew Jackson will actually destroy. And really, we won't get it back. We sort of give it, get it back under Lincoln, but really until 1913 with the creation of the, of the Federal Reserve. Um, and opposes annexation of Texas, mainly because he believes it will lead to a fight over slavery. It's almost like he had a crystal ball. Known as the Great Compromiser. Compromise with the nullification crisis. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the Missouri Compromise and the Compromise of 1850, which will be in period five. So let's talk about John Quincy Adams real quick. He probably won't be on the AP exam. I know it's sad, but uh, um, he really didn't like being president. And his dad was John Adams. And uh, just like his dad, he's only going to serve one term as well. And uh, was a very good secretary of state. And actually, after being president, he was a member of the House of Representatives and really probably did more uh, during that time period than he did when he was president. And he's the only president to have ever done that, to actually to be president and then to go back to Congress. So, um, but he wins the election of 1824, which he ran against John, uh, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, of course, and two other people. Now, no one got a majority of the uh, the vote. So when no one gets a majority, and Andrew Jackson actually got the most, but he does not get a majority. He does not get over 50%. And if no one gets a majority, it goes to the House of Representatives. Now, the Speaker of the House in this time period was Henry Clay. So Henry Clay has a lot of power in choosing the next president. Uh, you would think that he would choose Andrew Jackson because he got the most votes. No, because he doesn't like Andrew Jackson. So he chooses John Quincy Adams. In return, John Quincy Adams chooses Henry Clay as his Secretary of State, essentially, you know, handpicking the next president because being Secretary of State was, you know, the quickest way to becoming a president. And so Jackson is uh, and his people are upset. And Jackson waits four years and then runs again and wins. Um, and so we'll talk about Jackson in a minute. But I wanted to quickly talk about the Supreme Court, and what's happening. Um, because the Federalists are gone as far as they're gone from Congress and the presidency after the Hartford Convention, but they are still around in the Supreme Court. And you see this with John Marshall. John Marshall is, uh, um, is basically Alexander Hamilton and maybe did more. I know and this is, it's crazy to say this, but maybe did more than Hamilton. I don't know. Okay. Um, I might make a musical about this guy. Don't tell anyone. Um, anyways, John Marshall, Federalist, um, and a darn good Federalist. And so he's really going to kind of be the thorn in the side of the uh, Democratic Republicans and Andrew Jackson. Um, and so meaning he, he a strong federal government over, you know, states' rights. And, and the big, you probably won't see questions, but he's more of a, someone that would pop up in, in, in a civics test um, but he could be part of it and he could be useful for outside evidence uh, but what's important is uh, Marbury versus Madison where the uh, Supreme Court has the ability to review um, anything passed by Congress or anything that the president does um, and and really um, sets in stone Hamilton's beliefs with McCulloch versus Maryland um, and the National Bank okay the National Bank basically the federal government has lots of power over trade so trade between the states the federal government has you know really kind of an ending authority over that and then we get to roger b tawny which will who will be appointed by andrew jackson and tawny it's not taney it's tawny um tawny um sides with states a little bit more that states have some say over trade um that the federal government doesn't have just um you know, all of this power that states have some interest in regulating interstate commerce. Um, and so Tawny does a lot. Um, really, the thing he's remembered for is Dred Scott versus Sanford, which we will talk about next period. So without further ado, let's talk about Andrew Jackson, who is definitely fair game for this uh, DBQ. Um, and Jackson, um, whereas, you know, we talked about Jefferson, and Jefferson was really kind of elected uh you know, uh, really because of the three-fifths clause in the Constitution, where which gives the southern states more electoral power, uh, you could argue that Jackson was really elected by the common man. 
So in this time period, in the 1820s, as, as the country is growing west, the western states were kind of more democratic. They gave more power to common to the common men. Of course, women couldn't vote, uh, but property requirements for voting um, were largely done away with in the West, mainly because they wanted to, to encourage people to move there, whereas he still had some pro property requirements in order to vote in the North and the South. So, um, but those states were, were beginning because of the competition with the West. They were kind of forced to do the same. Um, so we see kind of more democracy now. People actually have... Um, you know, people, if you don't own property, you can vote, uh, which was pretty radical for the time. Um, and also the way that they they gave away the Electoral College delegates. Now, should st should state legislatures choose the, the electors that choose the president? Or should people have a say? In, and then the electors kind of obey whatever the people said, um, which is what they do today. So each state, you know, if, if your state votes for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, um, the electors are supposed to obey what the people uh, said. Um, the electors are supposed to obey, which doesn't always happen. And that really begins in the 1820s. And that's kind of one of the main reasons why Jackson was elected. He was from Tennessee, which in this era was kind of m more of a western state than a southern state. But it was, you know, technically a southern state. It was a slave state. Um, and so he comes into office. Um, and he's known for various things, Indian removal. He's going to remove the uh, five civilized tribes, as they were called, um, west of the Mississippi to modern-day Oklahoma, which was supposed to be permanent native land. Of course it's not, because it's Oklahoma today. Um, not remembered fondly for that. He says he was removing Indians to help them, to save them um, from, you know, from being killed, essentially, by white people. Um, and so, uh, obviously the native Americans didn't see it that way. And, and really, you know, in this time period, native Americans were, were criticized for not adopting, for not assimilating into white culture. Yet the Cherokee, they had their own newspapers, they had their own government. They, they did a lot of things that, you know, the white people were doing and they're like, we are essentially, you know, assimilating, we are adopting your ways. Uh, but that wasn't good enough. So they were uh, they were removed via the Trail of Tears. Technically, though, that was 1838, uh, which was the next president, um, Martin Van Buren, or Martin Van Ruin, as he was known. But it was essentially Jackson. He gets um, he's known for Indian removal. Uh, Jackson does not like the National Bank. He does not like Hamilton's bank. And he will destroy the National Bank. He will go up against the, the leader of the bank, which was Nicholas Biddle. He thinks that the bank caters to the rich, to the elite. Um, and he destroys it. He successfully does it. Um, his people like Henry Clay think it will be the end of Jackson. It's not. It made him more popular. Yet it did not help the economy. There's going to be a panic in 1837. We had, we had panics before we had depressions. Now we have depressions or recessions. They had panics back then. Um, so it's kind of debatable on, on the effects of the, uh, of the National Bank of destroying it, you know, the effects that it had. It doesn't really help our monetary policy. Banks, state banks, were issuing their own currency. So you, you'd have thousands of different bills, dollars, essentially, money that you had to carry around. Uh, very different from our, from our uh, federal reserve system that we have today. And then the nullification crisis. Um, whereas, and his vice president is part of this, who is uh, John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. Um, essentially, South Carolina does not like this new tariff that has passed because, uh, again, it caters more to the North and the West, and it makes things more expensive for the South. And so uh, um, John C. Calhoun, who was vice president at this time, secretly writes um, this document, basically kind of restating a lot of Jefferson and Madison's arguments in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions saying that states have a right to nullify something, to not obey something if they think it's unconstitutional. And they thought this was unconstitutional, so South Carolina is not going not gonna to obey the tariff. Jackson says, oh yeah, you are. If you don't, I'm going to uh, invade South Carolina. I'm going to send in troops called the Force Bill. Um, and that never happened because, guess what? Henry Clay comes in and compromises, and we get a compromise tariff. Uh, but Jackson was saying, hey, you're not going to mess uh, 
with this federal government, even though Jackson really didn't even like the tariff. Um, but he says, you're not going to mess, mess with us. So um, that's a quick overview of period four. We'll stop there and we'll enter period five soon, which will um, maybe lead to a civil war. So um, I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>